estamos, ¿dónde estamos? <risa> eh, para mí realmente es un placer muy grande, I'm very happy, <risa> eh, en presentarles a Lina Pai. Ella es bióloga, estudió en la Universidad de Suse, voy a ver mis, mis apuntes. Eh, trabajó en la Universidad de Warren, puede ser que se diga así, y actualmente eh, está no sé, bueno, trabajando en la Universidad de Chester. Senior Lecturer en el Centro de Estudios for Women and Gender en la Universidad de Warren. Y es una feminista que ha trabajado eh, desde la biología, en, en campos que tienen que ver con el estudio de las hormonas y también de los estudios de género y feministas. Y hoy día nos va a presentar eh, un poco de su trabajo. Y bueno, nada más que agradecerle la, la presencia y confiarnos a escucharla. Please stop me if uh, I am speaking too fast, because I have to speak in English, um, or if there is something you don't understand. When I was asked to come and talk to you about being a feminist and doing biology, I decided to call it sitting on the fence, because that phrase in English means that you don't know which side of the fence to go. You're a little bit here and a little bit there. When I received the translation, of course, it is something different in Catalan, um, swimming between the waves. And that contrast between the two languages, completely different metaphors, sums up how I feel about the difficulties of being a biologist and being feminist. Um, because on the one hand, I have to, as a feminist, engage with a lot of critiques of biology, of the sciences. At the same time, I have been for many years trying to do science. So those are two quite different things very often. So I think the, the fact that we have two languages that make different translations is rather apt. It, it's a rather good way of starting. Um, I'll start off a little bit then with my background. What I should say first, since I'm going to be talking about feminism, is that my background is partly in feminist politics. I was heavily involved in the women's movement a long time ago, but <laughs> and um, in environmental and animal politics. I'll come on to that a little bit later because although As you've heard, some of my research has had to do with hormones. More recently, most of my research has been to do with human-animal relationships. As you've heard, I am by training a biologist. I did my PhD in animal behavior. And I've spent most of my life focusing on feminist science studies which is kind of a bit of a contradiction, feminist science studies, for the reasons that I have already said. On the one hand, you have to engage with critiques, which tell you that there are so many things wrong with or difficult about biological arguments for feminists. And then I'm also doing it. So it's pretty difficult, and I spend an awful lot of time sitting on the perch somehow between the two. But you know, continuing with the metaphor, if you sit on a perch or a fence, there is one advantage, you can look both ways. And then, as I've mentioned more recently, I've been engaging with something that we can call human-animal studies. Now in this talk, there is going to be three parts. In the first part, I want to ask about what kind of research we might be talking about when we say we do feminist research or whatever. What are we talking about? What are the sort of broad characteristics of research? I then want to talk about feminist critiques of thinking and practicing in biology. Uh, but mostly I'm going to be talking about how I try to do research in my life how I've tried to think about some of the issues that feminism has raised. I don't think I have the answers. All I can say is that I have spent many years trying to think about what it means to be a biologist 
and a feminist. And there are two areas of my own research that I'll have a brief look at. One is to do with animal development, the development of behaviour in animals, and then more recently, my research in human-animal relationships. Now, if we're going to be talking about what is research, and you look at the broad spectrum of feminist literature, we can make some generalisations about what, about what counts as feminist research. Of course, there are exceptions. This is very broad generalisation. The first is that a, a feminist research pro project would expect to take gender seriously. Of course, it would include women, it would include all kinds of marginalised groups. We know, I hope we all know, that much traditional research has been criticised by feminists precisely because it omits women, it marginalises women, marginalises women, or perhaps it takes um, heterosexuality for granted, or it makes certain assumptions about race, all of those things are the very ways in which feminists have criticised mainstream research in many disciplines. So feminist research must take um, patterns of in social inclusion seriously. In general, a lot of feminists are talking about research methods have emphasised that research ought to be participative, some kind of action research, for instance, but in particular it ought to be accountable. And there is a lot of uh, material written about how, if you're going to be doing research involving women or gender, um, then it ought to be accountable to the people you're working with. It's a bit trickier when you're working with animals, but I'd like, we can come back to that. But of course, in all of these debates, feminist uh, commentators have always said trouble with trying to do accountable research is that the researcher always has power. You as the researcher decide that you will publish. You may talk to your, the people you have interviewed, but you decide you're going to get it published. You will get the PhD. In general, feminists are more likely to emphasize interdisciplinary research. And I suppose that's what I've been good at over the years. I've tried to be interdisciplinary. And to put things into a context, they t feminist research tends not to just focus down onto one little thing. It's very difficult. This is a whole literature on what counts as feminist research. So I, this is a very brief summary. And as several people, but notably Donna Haraway, has noted, the knowledge should be situated. That is, Feminist research should pay attention to the position of the person who does the knowing. So I come to research as being white, middle class, English, a lesbian, you know, all of those things. And on the whole, feminist research has tended to favour qualitative data-led projects. Not always, but usually, often. It's quite a contrast when you come to research in the natural sciences. And here I have to start by talking about feminist critiques of science. Generally, the feminist critiques have pointed out that much of the practice of science, the natural sciences, have been exclusionary. On the whole, there has been a problem about the numbers of women in the sciences. And in some of the physical sciences, that's still true perhaps not in biology anymore, but there is still a problem. Feminist critics have underlined the difficulties of the emphasis in the way that scientists are trained on objectivity. We may think that it's important to be objective, but what that does is to position the person who's doing the science as outside what is being known. Objectivity is about standing outside. And that is problematic. But that's part of the feminist critique. 
Um, and here you have to think in particular of the work of the American philosopher of science, Sandra Harding, who's written a great deal about objectivity and the problems for feminist critiques. In relation to biology particularly, one of the strongest sets of criticisms from feminists has been that the knowledge gained in biology is too often reductionistic. That is, it becomes so fashionable to be pursuing ever smaller bits of DNA in the search for something, um, in the search for causes. It's very mechanistic and it tends to ignore context. And we can come back to that, but that's part of the mainstream feminist criticism. Related to that, uh, not all of biology, but certainly some, when it becomes popularized in the newspapers, can be deterministic. And that has for many decades been a, a, a plank of feminist critiques of biology that feminists, quite understandably and rightly, disagree with the notion that, oh, I don't know, for example, um, women have the genes to make us good at ironing. You saw how often I pick up an iron and iron my clothes. Uh, then you realize what the joke that was. But those claims get made. That was from a book that was published not that long ago. That there's something about women's biology that makes them good at ironing. When you get claims like that, of course, feminists don't like it, and um, we have lots of things to say about it. That's the popularized version of biology, but of course, in a, when biology as a whole is putting so much emphasis on search, searching for genes for this and genes for that, then in a way, it isn't surprising that the popular version becomes so deterministic. And of course, science as a whole is largely quantitative and hypothesis driven. So that's quite a contrast to what I've just said about what feminists emphasize in feminist research. So if you're a feminist and a biologist, it's a significant challenge to try to find ways of doing research in biology that are perhaps less reductionist, you can try, that pay attention to context and are accountable. Now I can perhaps talk a little bit about the first two. The question of accountability when you are, as I have been all my life, dealing with animals is quite, is a lot more difficult and might be something we could discuss. I have written about it, but that's probably not a main a thing I want to focus on now. So the main question then of what I'm addressing is can we bring, can we bring feminist ideas into doing biological research or is it an impossible dilemma? Am I, in other words, a feminist who happens to do research in biology a feminist critic of science, I think both of those, maybe. Or am I doing feminist science? Some years ago, yes, quite a few years ago, we, use, we used to write about the possibility of doing feminist science. I'm not sure that I know, I knew then what feminist science was. I'm not sure I know now but it's still something I would like to ask. Can we do feminist science, or is it simply that I'm a feminist who happens to do biology? <coughs> now, there has been some impact of feminist ideas and practices on practices in biology. Um, the historian of science, Londa Schiebinger, has written uh, quite extensively on this and looked at the ways in which, from the late 60s, through to today, feminism has had some impact on some scientific disciplines. Um, first of all, changing numbers. We can certainly say that in a number of areas of science, there are now far more women than there were 30 years ago. Um, whether that's to do just with feminism, but certainly it's to do with changing ideas. <coughs> 
So the problem of exclusion then is arguably less. Um, one of the other ways in which feminism has had some impact is on what Evelyn Fox Keller called learning to see. Now, when she was writing about it, she was partly writing about what the, the, the notion of learning to see down a microscope. <coughs> If you're, when you're doing that at school or in university training, what you have to do is learn, first of all, how to manipulate the microscope so that you're not simply looking at a reflection of your eye. Um, and then, having done that, you have to learn to see what is down there, that it's not just loads of squiggles and dots and circles, that there is something there. You have to learn how to interpret what you see down there. And I'm using it here as a kind of metaphor because what we can say has been an impact of feminism is that there is now more recognition of gender bias. There are more people, women and men, throughout the sciences who can recognize that some ideas are produced in ways that are biased. So it is now much more recognized that uh, for example, we have tended to use, uh, to, to base a lot of ideas in healthcare on a standard which is basically young white men. And that is problematic if that is a standard in healthcare for the entire population. And finally, there's been some impact, arguably, on changing hypotheses. In other words, there, is now, there are now more ways in which gender is brought into the doing of science. Let me just give you a couple of examples. One, which Schiebinger writes about, um, is primatology. Um, and of course, Donna Haraway has also written a lot about this. In primatology, over the last five decades or so, six decades, there has been something of a paradigm shift. In the 1940s, um, Haraway wrote about this a great deal in Primate Visions. You could find most primatologists, mostly men, were at that point tending to see in groups of primates lots of examples of male dominance, which of course they then, they saw it, they then projected it onto human behaviour. With the impact of feminism, in part, more and more women, more and more feminists in particular, have entered primatology, and the ways in which hypotheses are generated has shifted. People are far more likely to see females and what females are doing as the centre of the group, and certainly to ask important questions about them. Um, another area which is perhaps less clear cut is a much more recent one um, in the last, this decade, um, has been the rise of something called gender specific medicine. Now, this began because of this issue about the standard in healthcare, which has been based on young white um, males. Um, and recognition that that was problematic, that therefore what constituted women's health needs were getting missed out. I don't think that any of us would disagree with that. I think that, of course, that's important. But then we've got this new journal and a new field, gender-specific medicine, which I'm less happy about because we are now seeing the generation of enormous numbers of scientific research papers which are looking for very small sex differences or gender differences in some very tiny bit of biochemistry, an enzyme or a protein. And it, they're increasingly focusing on difference and gender difference, no other social differences. So gender difference is becoming more consolidated through that. So I, I have worries about that one. Okay, now I want to turn then to how thinking about 
doing feminist research has impacted in my own life. I'm going to very briefly mention some education projects I was involved in. Um, the research I did in um, hormones and thinking about, trying to think about less reductionist methods. And finally, aiming for interdisciplinarity, in more, and particularly in my more recent work on humans and other animals. It's easy to talk about interdisciplinarity, and I did my early training at the University of Sussex, which has always prided itself on being interdisciplinary. But how easy is it to be interdisciplinary? You don't get research grants very easily for interdisciplinary projects. Okay, now remember back to what I said about what counts as feminist research. Well, one of the things that I can say I've done in my life, and I'm pleased that I did it, I'm glad that I did that, it was a good project, was um, an education project working with um, local disadvantaged women in the area of the University of Warwick, that was the city of Coventry, and we ran a Women into Science project, which was trying to encourage women to, uh, who had been completely excluded from science very early on in their lives, to uh, find ways of thinking about it and taking it up and finding that it could be fun. Um, we did some research projects that were heavily integrated with this, um, in particular because a lot of the women we were working with were from local Islamic communities, uh, so we did some research which looked at um, the ways in which their ideas around Islam interacted with how they thought about gender and science. I'm quite happy to do that as far as we, we made it as participative as we could. It was as accountable as we could make it. We kept feeding the information back to those communities. And we worked very hard at evaluating the prior knowledge that everybody had, which is of course quite different from the way science is conventionally taught. Um, the women that we were working with constantly said the science that they learnt at school was very different from the stuff that they knew, which was common sense. And the common sense they knew, they felt, was not being valued. I was quite happy with that. I'm happy to call that a feminist research project. But then, slightly earlier, earlier in my life, I was doing work on sex hormones. And this is where I'm less clear about whether I think this counts as feminist research. Um, these were the animals. We were interested at the time in the effects on animal behaviour of a hormone belonging to the group called the progestins. Um, that is, those hormones that are similar to, they, also, they include, the one hormone called progesterone in English. We were particularly interested in a hormone called medroxyprogesterone, which is, was then and still is used as a contraceptive in women. So one of the interests then came from a background in women, involved with women's health. That bit I'm okay about. That's a feminist concern. I'm not sure how much it's a feminist concern when you start doing the laboratory studies with the animals. But still, we were interested then in the effects of progestins. You can look at how, if you give animals progestins, what happens to gender development. I'll pause here for a minute. In English, sex and gender has, in feminist literature, long been separated. Gender means that which is in the culture. It's something, therefore, which you learn, and sex we referred to back in the 70s as the biological, that that's what you can't, you know, I was born female, I suppose, I've got two X chromosomes, I think. <laughs> um, and so that's, I then learnt to become feminine or not so feminine or whatever. I learnt what it means to be female in Western culture. However, 
partly because of the in influence of feminism, gender differences is the word, is the phrase that's used in talking about even rats. So forgive me if I carry on talking about gender differences. Okay, so we, that's what we were interested in, hormones and gender differences in animals. Now, in all of the literature, in biology, about hormones and gender in animals, there are lots of assumptions made. When you talk about these differences, you're making a statement about differences in populations, which are then projected backwards onto individuals. Right? So, I talked earlier about gender-specific medicine. On average, women might be more or less likely than men, on average, to have a particular amount of a particular protein. So what you've then got is a population difference, which I've tried to summarise with that um, normal distribution curve at the left, which is then projected backwards in the life of the individual, because what most of the literature on gender differences in biology does is to identify an average difference in populations and then look for causes within individual biology. So that's going from a population statement to a statement about individual biologies. They also do the same with respect to differences about um, sexual orientation. So you've got that backward projecting along with assumptions being made about the direction of causality. So most, a very big most, most of the literature on gender differences and biology will be writing about genes or hormones, reductionist, genes or hormones which cause behaviour. So the challenge then, for me who's trying to think I don't want to be all that reductionist, I can see that hormones are involved somehow, but there are other things. The challenge is to think about gender, sex, as being produced by many interacting things, not only one, even in laboratory animals. Clearly, I'm not going to come around and say that I think my femaleness or my lesbianness is all down to a particular hormone or other. I'm a feminist, I'm not going to make those statements. I think it's much more complicated, there are lots of things. But actually I think there are lots of things involved in all other organisms too. So, what then would it mean if I was involved in this area of research to ask feminist questions? So, I was thinking at the time um, about issues of gender development. <coughs> what would I need to understand? I would need to understand first about the context in which the biological processes are happening. That is, hormones do not happen just inside cells, they are much more contextualised, there is much more going on. Now, most biologists know this. There are problems when what biologists say and report in scientific research papers become news in the media. So, even though most biologists will say, well, yes, I know it's not like that, they have still written about hormones causing behaviour. And we also need to understand how our knowledge about hormones, for example, is developed. Where does that knowledge come from? So, looking at the area that I was working on, how do differences between the baby animals emerge? Now, if you're talking about people, you might say, well, yes, I might acknowledge that, for example, having two X chromosomes is involved in 
my becoming a woman. Um, so chromosomes and genes are involved, hormones are involved, but then so are processes of development. And by that I mean the things that are going on that are not just about genes or hormones. So when, for example, in verte virtually all of the vertebrates, you're developing from something like, that looks a bit like a stick, and you develop this limb, virtually all vertebrates have the same limb structure, except the very basic fish. It goes one bone, two bone, two bones, five, five, five. That's called the pentadactyl limb. But what happens in early development is that the, there are some sort of electromagnetic fields, maybe chemical fields, chemical gradients, that, that maybe the genes set things up, but then things are changed as the limb develops. So one thing leads to another, which creates the conditions for the next thing to happen. So one thing going on to another. That can't easily be reduced to genes or hormones. So if we're talking about how gender develops, then it's not just genes and hormones. It's a whole set of complex processes of biological development. And of course, as a feminist, we would say, yes, well, it's also about how the parents behave. And it's the whole social material world in which we grow up, from television to early school years, the whole culture in which you grow up, and of course political power. So becoming female alone, becoming gendered, involves far more than the double helix. It does involve these two things, which I want to emphasize here for a moment, even for lab animals. Let me explain. Um, in the work that we were doing, uh, us and some other labs, we found that, yes, if you start changing the hormonal environment of the baby rat, then you also change how its mother behaves towards it. So you're not then simply changing the hormones within that baby rat. You are changing a whole social world because the mother starts to behave differently and she's then behaving differently towards you and towards your siblings. So the whole lot counts together. One baby, two babies, ten babies, and mum, dad, maybe other individuals around. Maybe it's based on smell, who knows? That's not important. The point is that parental behaviour does differ depending on what the babies smell like, and that in turn depends on what their hormonal milieu is. So it's very difficult to separate what's cause and effect here if you get gender differences emerging. How much is the hormones? How much is because of mother's behaviour? Very difficult to tell. And I mentioned social material worlds because one of the things which has interested me more recently is that we gain a great deal of our knowledge about how things like hormones work from laboratory animals. And we've known for some time that how you keep laboratory animals where they live and how you test them, you put them in a cage to test them, those two can affect how they behave. So we've known for a long time that if you look at what's sometimes called female rat sex behaviour, which means basically that the female rat sticks her tail in the air and waits for the male. Now, you may have problems with this. Yes, I certainly did. The very, for a long, long time, the tests were done in an arena about this big, put a female in, then put a male in, and see what happens. 
that's not at all what happens in the wild. In the wild, a female rat is giving signals to the male. She's the one who does much of the, sorts out much of the timing. She says, ah, not now, wait, I'm going over there. And she coordinates it. You change the size of the arena, you change the behavior. Therefore, you change how you interpret how hormones affect behavior. So, both parental behavior and social material worlds matter even for laboratory animals. And I thought that that's, I think that for me, that is part of the way I would address as a feminist. I'm trying to think of how I think about gender as a feminist, and I'm trying to do research in biology that involves hormones. How do I bring those together? It's not an easy thing, and I don't think it's the answer, but I'm just telling you what I did trying to think about those issues. So, going to the earlier question, what's feminist research? I'm going to just say, well, let me think about what I've been doing. Inclusion, participative, contextualised, knowledge is situated, what about those? Well, what I've just been talking about, gender differences in animals, in a way I'm trying to take gender seriously, um, because I'm trying to think about how do these animals' gender experiences arise. I don't take it for granted that just because you're born a female rat and you have two X chromosomes, that therefore you're going to behave in a feminine way, any more than I often don't behave in a feminine way. Um, that should be next to participative. Oh, clearly not. It can't be participative if I'm testing laboratory animals. Forget that one. Um, and accountable? No. I went on doing laboratory research for a while. It's interdisciplinary in the sense that I'm trying to think about the context. So I sort of hesitate, but I tick that box. And situated knowledge, well, my situatedness as a knower, I have no idea how much I brought of me to that research. We could discuss that. I'm going to turn from that very, that was very problematic. That was research I did about 25 years ago, so maybe I'll change. Um, what I'm going to just briefly now do now is to show, talk to you a little bit about some feminist answers to trying to think about more, less reductionist and more contextualised approaches to thinking about how gender develops in living organisms. In part, this draws from what um, Barbara McClintock, uh, from Barbara McClintock's work, when Evelyn Fox Keller did a biography of the maize geneticist Barbara McClintock. She talked about her work emphasizing a feeling for the organism. Now, lots of people have criticized uh, Keller for saying that perhaps any good biologist should have a feeling for the organism, and it is not just women, not only women or feminists, who would have this. And of course that's true. What Keller was trying to emphasize that what made McClintock's work ahead of her time um, was this idea that she could somehow project herself into her ears of corn and think about a feeling for the organism almost from within it. It's trying to understand the organism from within. So some feminists then have, have, have said that certainly good science would have to do that, um, and you need to do that to do good science that fits better with feminist um, ideals, if you like. Um, feminist Feminist critics have also talked about the need to emphasise whole organisms. We're not very keen on very reductionist science because it does tend to um, lead into biological determinism and that is almost always problematic for feminist thinking. 
Um, so I've mentioned already this idea of fields of action, which is somehow more than just the, the actions of genes, um, about the, the way that the limb develops, for instance. And so that, that is more consistent with thinking along feminist lines, thinking about whole organisms and their contexts. The feminist biologist um, Anne Fausto Sterling has written a lot about uh, something that's used, that's used in psychology particularly called developmental systems theory. Again, it's trying to think in terms of system, whole systems of which genes and hormones are maybe part, but they're whole systems which can include social, cultural contexts. And finally, um, Fausto Sterling, amongst others, has written about um, dynamic ideas in development, particularly epigenetics. Um, epigenetics is the idea that you can actually get some changes over time which can be inherited but which are not inherited through genes. So this, for example, is the idea that an organism can actually acquire a trait and somehow this gets passed on. Now for a long time, those of us who were brought up to think Darwin was next to God, the idea that characteristics could be acquired and passed on was, no, cannot happen. But it does seem to be the case that there are some things which can be passed on in such a way. Uh, well, these, well, before I get on to that, the, all of these discussions uh, come from feminists who are trying to think about how you do how you pursue ideas of gender development with, uh, within a feminist framework, if you like. How can you do it and move away from genetic reductionism? None of these are absolute answers. They're all partial answers. But I mentioned epigenetics as one of these partial answers. It's becoming terribly fashionable now. And one of the um, recent forms is precisely this maternal um, licking response in the rats that I talked about a minute ago. Um, and it turns out that the ways that mother rats interact with their offspring, they may be responding to the babies smell differently because of the baby's hormones, they respond differently, but as they, as they respond differently, they cause changes in the babies which works through a system of, of transmitters in the brain, that's chemicals that are transmitting nervous impulses in the brain, and it comes through to affect a particular gene that's involved in stress responses. So the, basically a good mother rat who does lots of licking is one who has babies that are better able to cope with stress, in short. Um, but that becomes inherited. That tendency to lick your babies more, to respond more to them, is then something which is inherited. So the whole thing gets changed and passed on from generation to generation. So, I'm not saying that's feminist research. I'm just saying that while I was doing research in these areas, I was always trying to think, well, I'm a feminist, what do I think is important if I'm trying to move away from doing reductionist science? So for me, at that time, that involved thinking about the context in which hormones work, looking at multiple ways in which differences are produced, and understanding about how ideas about hormones are constructed. Now, I'm not particularly going into that now, but <coughs> The, the very idea of sex hormones is itself problematic because, for example, we've inherited the idea that some, in English at any rate, some hormones are called female sex hormones, the estrogens, for instance. Years ago, that became immediately problematic when they discovered that androgens, so-called male hormones, work by being converted in cells to female hormones, estrogens. So immediately you can see it's a very muddy area. So what 
I've been trying to get at is, I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to self claim I'm not doing feminist research. I'm trying to think about how I, as a feminist, was trying to think about doing biology at the time. I was trying to move away from reductionist interpretations, trying to treat the organism as contextualised and having agency. But what were the limitations? Well, clearly, I can't, in any of that, think about my own situatedness very easily. That's much more difficult. It's clearly not participative. Lab rats don't get much choice in the matter. And, of course, However much we might talk about context and say, well, there's all these interesting ideas out there like developmental systems theory, they don't really challenge the domin dominant model, which remains genetic determinism. That's the stuff that gets in the newspapers. So I kind of think that I'm still sitting on this fence and trying to draw any lines between doing biology and doing feminist research is a bit of a muddy messy line, as you can see. So I wanted in that last part to talk about um, much more recent work, which is doing research on humans and animals. 